Hi, Shofa. It's so good to see you. Hi, Mina. I'm so happy to be here today. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thank you for saying yes to this. I'm really excited to um, have our viewers and listeners join in our conversation. And before we start, would could you share a little bit about who you are and your offerings to the world? Sure. My name is Shilpa Jain. I'm based here in the Bay Area, Berkeley, Oakland, um, also known as Ohlone Territory. I grew up in Chicago, and I've been working for the last many decades on community learning, bridge building, conflict transformation. What is it like to create, co-create healing communities, learning communities, and really um, bring forward transformation at every level, our inner work, our interpersonal relationships and communication, and especially work around conflict, and then systemic transformation. So yeah, that's what I'm very passionate about. I've been worked with a people's movement in India called Shikshantar for over 10 years, um, and then was executive director of YES, an organization based here in California for um, over 11 years. And at the moment, just opening myself to the next leadership thing. I don't know what's going to come, but it will come. And in the meantime, really grateful to be able to bring my skills and abilities around bridge building and community learning and conflict forward in the world. Oh, yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Chopa. And I met you at the jam. I met you um, when you were executive director of YES, and this was in 2017. It was an education transformation jam, and I remember walking in, and you were the first person I remember seeing because you were walking towards me with this big smile on your face, your twinkly eyes, and your long arms outstretched for a hug, and I was like, Oh, okay. Yeah, that's how it was. And so I was just, and you know, I'm shell shocked from my experience that I'm coming from. So I'm just like, oh, okay. And it just, I remember just feeling literally embraced that whole time in that gym. It really was transformative for me. And in the seven years that I've gotten to be in yes gems with you and build relationship with you as my personal, one of my many mentors and sister and friend. I am constantly, yeah, inspired by who you are and the work you do. And yeah, I'm just really grateful. Oh, thank you so much, Mina. The feeling is very mutual. I feel <laughs> so much delight. I remember seeing you at that jam uh, when you arrived and just was like, my friend. <laughs> it felt so immediate. Um, and it has continued to feel that way. So I love all the things we get to work on and co-create together. Um, and just for listeners and viewers, JAMS, um, or the work of, yes, the organization that I directed, it's really um, gatherings of the experience of beloved community, gatherings of change makers who are committed to do the inner work, build those relationships and vision and co-create towards the world we want to see in a variety of themes, geographies, identities, all kinds of things coming together, but yeah, it's uh, they're in the spirit of a musician's jam that we are co-creators and co-learners and co-listeners and what can you know, the kind of magic that can come out from from that kind of experience. So grateful to you, Mina, for being a jam leader and for um, getting to collaborate in so many things together. Yeah, actually, now that you're describing the jam, that's the first place that I really started to learn about what it means to be a secure attachment figure, what it means to create spaces that feel safer, where people feel seen and soothed and more secure. And that's how I actually felt in that 2017 jam and um, constantly unlearning and learning how to, you know, grow into that, into that secure attachment figure for myself and for the communities I'm a part of. Yeah. Oh, it's okay, so it is. You know, I think that's the work, you know, it can't be done in isolation. You know, it, attachment is by definition, a relational thing. It is community based it is, um in, it will manifest or not manifest in the different relationships we have or be somewhere in that spectrum. And I think when we can really focus on what is the kind of space we're nurturing and who are the people who are coming to it and what do they need and what do I need as part of it as well, then we co-create something very different that is actually focused on um, security and safety and the opportunity to grow and learn and yeah, all of those things together. 
Whoa, it's just landing for me how we call it the four S's. It's from Dr. Daniel Siegel. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's always been a part of the gym. It's always been in my life. And of course I find myself in places like Fuel Ed that continues to do this work. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> Feels good. It makes sense. That's how we want to be in the world, right? <laughs> I'm like, the, the dots are connecting in real time right now. <laughs> And, and, you know, what does it look like to imagine change in the world, right? Transformation, whether it's in education or environmental issues or political, um, social justice, racial justice, any of those fields, how do we do that from a place that invites that kind of connection and attachment, right? That both fosters it through the process of making that change happen, as well as expands it by the kind of change that we're making. So we're working on kind of all these different angles simultaneously, like what's happening internally? How are we building that in our relationships? What are the practices? What are the skills? And what are the ways that that shapes the work that we do in the world? And then how does that work become more part of that whole system so that we're not having to like separate and do something over here to try to you know, mitigate or, or correct or heal something over there, but actually it's like fused together. So um, yeah, so that our change work actually becomes part of the, the expansion of systems of safety and security and healing and soothing and yeah, all of that. Exactly. Yeah. And feel that we talk about that too. It's like, yes, we're talking about being secure attachment figures in the context of schooling and education. And this is just every day work that we can do for ourselves and for the people in our lives yeah that's where it really it matters everywhere absolutely yeah yeah and uh speaking of education Shilpa you have a long-standing connection to your work in the field of education can you speak a little more about that sure yeah that started uh <laughs> I think even when I was a little child um, well, you know, honestly, it started with some questioning of the way schooling and education felt very different to me. You know, schooling was something I'd go to um, and I did well in it in terms of like the grades and all of that. But I felt like where I got curious and passionate was often in the spaces in between, not what was like directly part of my curriculum, but like what was the spaces to go and create things with my friends? What were the things that I was doing after school in terms of reading books that I was interested in and designing games and all kinds of things like that? And then later, as I got a little older into, you know, the clubs and the sports and the different things that I was doing around human rights and journalism and, you know, poetry and speech and, you know, all these different things that were just super interesting to me. Um, and so I also started to see actually at a pretty young age, because my school, I went to public school in um, outside of Chicago, my school had a tracking system. So we took a test in first grade, and then they determined in the school whether you'd go into gifted classes, go into just regular, you know, curriculum, or if you'd go into remedial. And I tested into the gifted, but I, I remember thinking as a kid, like, wouldn't every kid be interested in these kinds of puzzles and conversations? Like, why is it just some of us get to do this? Um, and that that continue that kind of question of like, why are certain people seen in certain ways and why are they put in certain tracks and how is that determined? You know, is it just like reading and writing skills? That feels really limited to me because I just saw so much brilliance from my classmates and so many different kinds of intelligences, right? And, and not just in, you know, a singular measure. And so that questioning kind of came to me at a young age and I was working with that through high school and raising all kinds of questions to my teachers and <laughs> creating all kinds of things. Um, but then later on in life, I joined um, in my early 20s, joined my brother and sister-in-law and fr a friend from Pakistan who were starting this movement on rethinking education in the Indian and Pakistani in the subcontinent um, in Asia, and really starting to tap into some other dimensions, which were around our traditional knowledge systems and around um, the wisdom that comes from working with our hands, craft and work and labor and connecting with the land and the wisdom that comes through our different cultures and languages, um, which was getting, you know, really eradicated in these last, oof, I don't know, we could say 500 years, we could say 200 years, 100 years, depending on how you think about colonization and, um, yeah, the, the loss of these systems. But anyway, just noticing that there was so much. And I think that part that really, you know, touched me was like, what are we losing 
in the process of enforcing one system on everybody. Um, and, you know, there's so many more and, and living and working in India for a decade, I was just like, there's so much more richness. There's so many more ways of living and learning and working together and yeah, sculpting life. Um, uh, and so how can we support that, nurture that, expand that, grow that, value it, honestly, um, so it doesn't get lost. So that's kind of my background in education and and really deep belief in peer-to-peer -peer learning and multi-generational learning, just seeing that when we come together across differences of either age or you know race, gender, any of the isms, any of those things that we actually build together, there's so much learning that can happen from one at one another. And a lot of that gets um, because of segregation of so many ways on so many levels, we lose again, lose out on the wholeness that is part of our humanity um, and our relationship to the earth as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So how do we recover and remember and reconnect? That's a lot of my work in education too. That's exactly what I felt when I first came into the gym. I'm like, whoa, this, this space is weaving together a lot of different things that I've experienced in silos. It's like, oh, all of me can be welcome here. And oh, I'm discovering these new parts of me that I've never been able to see because I was able to bring in all these other parts. It's like opening, continuing to open doors and more of me to come through, which feels both really liberating and, and a little scary because so much of society says this part is not welcome. <laughs> so yeah. 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 It's I think you hit you, you know, hit the nail on the head with that. Like it is scary and it is liberating. It's both. Um and, you know, what you're saying right now, it just makes me think about like segregation isn't just like a political or a social system. It's even an internal system, right? It becomes inside of us. Like I segregate myself and I do that as I'm reflected, that's reflected back to me in so many institutions. And it starts at such a young age, um, that kind of segregation. And so healing that and remembering connection and remembering you know, that we are whole human beings and we are whole beings in this wider world is such a liberating thing. And, and yeah, kind of very stretchy, very scary too, because it's like, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know because I learned from such a young age that I, that wasn't true, you know? So how do I unlearn that, you know, as part of the journey and, and do that in community? Yeah. And I know that for me, my experience going in, being in public school where there were very few Asian students and peers or educators. That part wasn't always visibilized or it wasn't always welcome or was definitely seen as other. And I'm curious, Shilpa, how has your Asian American identity influenced your role in the field of alternative ed or expansive ed, however mm -hmm. you want to call it? Yeah. Um, well, I grew up kind of differently. I, I had a lot of Asian community where I grew up. Um, my neighbors were Thai and Taiwanese and Chinese and Filipino and Korean and Indian and Pakistani and Japanese. So I really grew up in a ton of Asian community, which I feel incredibly grateful for. Um, and, and still it was also predominantly white um, you know, Eurocentric kind of curriculum and and place because I still grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. So it was a both and. I, I think a large part of my Asian identity that I connect with is the aspect of community and um and and hospitality and generosity. I think those pieces are really strong that I really inculcated from my parents first and foremost, and then their own roles as community builders as they were immigrants and seeking to build community themselves they uh, you know, connected with about 20 different families from the same part of India, Rajasthan, around the Chicago area. And we would just get together every weekend at someone's home. And so that was basically a lot of my childhood. So I got inculcated with a lot of the those values of, of, of sharing, of being together, of um, that community is a is an actual living thing. It's not something separate. It's just it's part of life. It's part of you know being human. Um, and so that part is really should, you know, as you can hear as I talk about education, that sense that we are all have something to give. We all have something to contribute, and we also have, all have something to receive, and we can do that together is such a formative part of how I understand um, learning spaces and learning communities. 
Um, another core part of it, I think, is the spiritual dimensions. Um, and I was raised Jane, like my last name, which is, you know, uh, Buddhism is some called sometimes called the middle path. Jainism is the extreme. <laughs> so Jainism came a little bit just before Buddhism and Buddhism, <laughs> but that was able to kind of you know, translate the concepts and the ideas, I think, better for the masses in a way that James really couldn't, because it was a little extreme, like you are, all the wisdom is inside of you, you, you know, there's like, you got to tap into that. Um, we all have the tools for our own liberation inside of us is kind of one of the core aspects of, of being Jane. Um, but, you know, generally the sense that everyone is a divine being, I think that also sits with me at the heart of my educational philosophy in my work. It's like everyone is a divine being. Everyone has and is gifted with and born with these tools and these things inside of them. It doesn't mean we all know how to get, get them out, you know, or know how to use them right away, but they're there. And that's like a foundational, um, yeah, aspect of my educational understanding. And I think that is a profoundly Asian concept that we're not empty vessels to be filled. We're not um, broken and need to be improved upon. We're like, no, actually as beings, we're full, we're whole. And we are constantly unfolding into our wholeness more and more. And that is the opportunity and the gift of each lifetime and that liberation. Um, yeah, the power and the keys of the liberation are inside of each one of us. And collectively, when we come together, we can actually unlock so much more. So it's uh, it's not that it's it's not there. It's just there. And maybe we need some support to, to see it, but it's all there. And yeah. And, and so the care and the kindness and the generosity and the recognition that um, everyone is here for purpose and everyone is here on purpose um, is I think a core part of how I approach education as well. Yeah. And those so can be cool. profoundly Asian. <laughs> yes. Gosh, it's, I've never heard you share about how your Asian identity influenced education. And I, I, I hear it in, in the many, many ways that it's been seeded um, since you were really young. And uh, I'm curious if there was a specific time in your personal schooling experience, if there is a moment that where you felt seen, secure, safe, and soothed, if you could share about that and why that was so impactful. Yeah. Um, yeah, there, I mean, there, there are several moments where I feel like I had a teacher, you know, who, well, there's two sides of it. I think there's the teachers that I had a few teachers in my, in my schooling experience who I think really saw me as a leader, as, you know, someone who had a lot of gifts to bring into the world. And they just affirmed that with so much yeah, positive reinforcement. Um, I remember my mom uh, <laughs> went to the, my freshman year of high school, went to the science department and said, my daughter can take chemistry and biology at the same time. And uh, <laughs> this is a little bit of classic Asian parenting, but that never had been done in my school, right? We just took biology as freshmen and then we took chemistry as sophomores. My, <laughs> my mom went, and the head of the department's like, ah, you know, that's not done. And my mom said, my daughter can do it. You know, if she can't do it. She can drop, drop the course, but let her try. And um, the fact that the department had first listened to my mom, you know, who she's like, I'm a doctor, my husband's an engineer and we can, our child can do this, you know, and just like, but that also, you know, um, you know, with her Indian accent, with her, you know, her English is quite good. It's not an issue, but, you know, still like how white Americans will hear that white American men might hear an Indian woman saying that. So that was something, but then the way that the teachers in the school also kind of like supported that, you know, that was really affirmative in a way that like, and, and that they didn't try to sabotage me or something like that. In fact, my chemistry teacher was an amazing lady and amazing woman. And she really was like, she was like four feet tall, and just like firecracker. And she was just always so super supportive and saw me in that. And so I felt really held in that moment. The other side of that, I would say in my experience is just these friends, right? I had so many Asian identifying friends. And so as first generation immigrants, we provided a lot of support to each other, you know, a lot. I can't even... Um, 
overestimate how much that was. It was huge. It was huge, the amount of support. And so even in moments, if the school was kind of like, whatever, we could like circle up during lunch and after school and have long, this was in the days of the corded phones, you know, we would talk on the phone and like, you know, meet up and, and care about each other and recognize that we were really transversing new territory because our parents had all grown up in Asia, whether, wherever that was. And we are growing up here and there was like a, a lot of conversational gap. And so we needed that support from one another. And that kind of really created an atmosphere throughout my childhood and adolescence that was like, yeah, so valuable I can remember for, yeah, for feeling that those four S's that you mentioned. Yeah. It's just making me think how even our young people who may not have the adult figures in their lives that can give the four S's that they're so, we're so wired to connect that we're going to find a way to seek those out. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And one way or another, right. And I hope, you know, I, I worry sometimes about youth today because of technology. We just didn't have any of that technology, Mina, you know, we didn't have phones, we didn't have social media, we didn't have any of that. And so all of our relating was person to person, voice to voice at the playground, in school, in the lunchroom, in the, you know, whatever, um, after school, meeting up, playing sports, playing games, whatever we were doing, but it was very face to face relational. Um, and so I think we could cultivate, or at least my friend group really worked on cultivating. We didn't have that, that language, but seeing each other, supporting each other to feel safe and secure and soothed when things were hard. We could also, we knew how to emotionally engage with each other, sometimes directly because we learned a little bit of that from our families, some people less, some some different Asian, there's an Asian span in that too, in terms of how much soothing we received and from which parent and how, or if at all. But we knew how to do it for each other too, and um, yeah. So I think there is something I can it concerns me now that a lot more young people have a more mediated engagement through technology, um, and so some of those ways of cultivating that as a peer group, as much as we do from our other adults in our lives. Yeah, it's just a question. Yeah, I think that's a big question for so many adults and. Even thinking about the youth who, you know, may not have had as much of the modeling of the four S's and then falling into groups that may not be so regulating or it, it can feel soothing, but what is that? What is the quality of the four S's? I think that's the question. And, um, and so just affirms like how much adults really need to work on our four S's so we can show up for our young people, model what healthy four S's really look like. Um, and Shoba, you do so much of that. You are, you have always consistently been somebody who has been a source of four S's for me. And mm -hmm. I know you're that for so many people, you so thousands of people, I can <laughs> safely say that. Yes. And um, I'm wondering, how do you resource yourself so that you could show up as a figure who is, um, who's able to make others feel more safe, secure, seen and um, soothed? Uh, well, I mean, I think a lot of that has to do with taking care of my body um, in terms of like good rest, good food, good water, exercise, all of that. Like it sounds very basic, but when my internal system is well tended to, then I feel like I can really offer a lot into the world. Um, and I can notice that when those things are not, those moments that I kind of slip off and oh, I haven't eaten all day or I'm not really getting up to move around or, you know, I didn't sleep well, I can see the impact that that has on my the, the kind of capacity I have to offer those four S's forward. Um, another big part is that I know I'm not alone, you know, like I'm not, I don't, I, it's taken some time to unlearn. And I think this might also have to do with being Asian and immigrant, this sort of like carry the weight of the world on me and then like manage through, struggle through and hide my needs and don't talk about like, no, I've had to really unlearn a lot of that. And really feel like 
part of what I've been doing, and you've seen this, Nina, is really supporting us to cultivate the web, you know, the web of relation, the web that I can also fall in when I need and need and, you know, struggling and need support. And so I don't isolate myself when I need support. I actually lean into that web and turn to you and turn to other friends that you know to um, to listen to me, to see me, to support me too. And so that, because I'm in the web of reciprocity and that web of fullness, I feel like then it you know gives me the nourishment I need to also carry it forward. Um, but I think I I was trained in a little bit, both education wise as well as Asian immigrant wise to like try to carry the weight on my shoulders alone or be sort of a hub and a spoke where I'm at the center and then everybody else is. And that's just too much pressure. And I, I've seen that actually not work well for my family members and, you know, extended community members, and especially for women who take a lot of that on, it doesn't work well, it doesn't suit well, you know, there's just too much. And so I've been kind of consciously in the last I would say 25, 30 years, really. And even as a kid thinking like, oh yeah, we're all here to support each other. We're here, we, we got each other, you know? And so I'm one, but I'm not the one or the only one, you know? And so, yeah. Um, and I've gotten some really good reflections from friends over the years. They're like, how good it feels when I lean into them because they know how much I they can lean on me. And so they're like, thank you for leaning into me too. Thank you for being there, you know? And so those those are the couple of big places of like the web and then yeah making sure my physical wellness is strong and I think the last place is that I always try to turn to nature um, and spirit you know and for me my spiritual practice really connects a lot to nature and the earth and so as I turn there I can sort of feel into yeah everything is interconnected and nothing is alone and so when I can do that then I don't it kind of feeds both sides my health as well as the the web. Hmm. Yeah, I'm grateful to be a part of your web. <laughs> <It's out. laughs> okay, well, we're about to close up here, Shoba. Any anything you feel like would be helpful for folks who are in the field of education now? It's just such a hard time um, for admin, for any leaders in this field, educators. We see that all the time in the news. Any final thoughts you want to share? I mean, my big thought is how do we create more webs in our schools and webs among our classrooms and classroom to classroom, you know, and to really heal that segregation. There's a lot of segregation that's still going on. And I'm not just talking like, yes, there's racial seg segregation and sometimes gender and class and all of that, that those things exist. But even also on top of that, just the segregation of like a teacher being isolated and, you know, not feeling the school as like an integrated whole, you know, where is this webs that teachers and administrators and parents are sort of weaving together? Where are the webs that children are also part of weaving together? And I never leave kids out of that. They actually have tremendous capacity to be part of weaving these webs. And we can inculcate that sense of those four S's um, together with the kids, you know, it's not something we do for them. We do it together. We all do it together. And as they weave those webs with the, their teachers and with their schools as a whole, something very powerful will happen. You know, it, it is happening when we see it. I, in my work in India, I, I did a little bit of work in schools, but a lot of my work was also outside of schools and neighborhoods and communities. And we'd have children of all ages coming together from all different kinds of caste and class backgrounds and religious backgrounds, so a lot of diversity. But what we do is weave a web together where we're all co-creating and co-responsible for each other. And, um, you know, it wasn't this thing, it was like this external figure trying to get and hold the whole, that kind of hub and spoke model. It was like, we're here, we're doing something together. These are the things we're agreeing to do together. This is how we're going to operate. And we, we build and the amount of learning and sharing and care and magic, honestly, that would emerge was powerful. So that would be the thing that I would offer. Um, and I, th I think that relates deeply to this Asian identity too. It's, it's like, I, there are parts I appreciate about US society for sure. And um, one of the things I think we can always do more healing is, is out of the individualism and more into the collective. And it just, the individualism isn't working for the U.S. You know, the loneliness epidemic is real. The like 
health consequences, the mental illness, the drug abuse, the suicide, all of that is real. It's happening. And I think a lot of it has to do with the breakdown of our collectives um, and collective opportunities. And so how can we weave that in more into our practice? And how do we have to learn that? Because a lot of people didn't grow up with it. You know, I had a gift to get to grow up with it, but not everybody did. So how do we support each other to learn, have patience, have grace, you know, understand that it's a learning journey um, for ourselves and each other. So that would be my offering forward. We're, we're, we're better together. We're wiser together, you know. Oh, thank you, Shopa. Oh, I'm feeling my heart just like feeling massaged with, with the wisdom that's coming through this conversation. And yeah, hoping for more weaving together here and the wider webs that we're creating, um, even through the work with yesworld.org, fuel ed, etc. I mean, yeah, people are doing amazing work and to be able to plug in together. Like this is another weaving of like yes world and fuel ed. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Amazing. Yes. Yay. Yes. And also our work on global roundtable leadership, you know, and working on shared leadership together. You know, we're all trying to find different ways to weave these webs of connection and support so many folks can can experience it from whatever angles they're able to participate from. So feel really grateful. Thank you for doing this work.